I'm very privileged to be here at ICOM UK and meeting Dave Stockley, G4 ELP, uh, the founder of the company, because a very important year last year for ICOM, 50th anniversary of ICOM itself and the 40th anniversary of ICOM UK. So, Dave, been an interesting 40 years, I guess. Yes, it certainly has, yes. How did the business start for you? How did you get into the business of selling amateur radio gear? Well, I was a radio amateur and uh, uh, myself and another ham, we decided to uh, uh, see if we can get direct import uh, from ICOM because we both had ICOM radios and um, that's how it started. And so what uh, year was this? That was 1974 in around about March. So at that time, there wasn't much ready-made gear that you could buy. Amateurs were used yeah. to making their own or buying ex-war department stuff. Very, very little around. In fact, there was uh, dear old Bill Lowe, who's long gone now. Um, he was about the, he was one of the first ones, and then SMC. Uh, and they were both fighting over Yeso at the time. But when you decided to start this business as a radio ham, thinking, right, well, I can see there's a, there's a potential market here, you were actually in the fire service at the time. Yes, I was, yes. I was a fireman, but I'd had quite a bad accident and uh, broken my femur, and I was uh, expected to carry on for quite a bit, but it was getting harder and harder. So in the end, we decided to start the business up. But I carried on working in the fire service uh, at Whitstable, uh, until we got it to a stage where I could, uh, could take a wage. Now you must have thought it was right place, right time. So in the history of amateur radio, we're at a point where this manufactured gear is beginning to come in from Japan and there's a hunger for it here in the UK. But you had a real faith in this, didn't you? Because you put everything into this business. Yes. I, um, in fact, the compensation I, I received from uh, my broken leg <coughs> was a total of £7,000. I put all of that in, uh, plus put my house on the line. Um, so we actually started with £7,000 each and it turned out to be uh, not a bad deal. And where was the business based then? Um, at the time, <laughs> I, it was still at the fire station in Whitstable, <laughs> but after a few months I moved up uh, at the top of the hill and um, of course, because I was a radio ham, uh, and uh, we set it up in one of the rooms in the house. So you literally started this business out of a spare room in your house? Yes, yes. So how did it go from the beginning? Because you've put everything in it, you've put your house on the line. What were you hoping to do in that first year? Well, our first forecast, because the Japanese love figures and forecast, um, we forecast £80,000 turnover, which was okay in those times, but we actually manage 130,000 wow. and um, it, we, we did very well and of course it, I didn't actually take very much in the way of a wage because um, we wanted to get the thing cracking. Thanet Electronics was the the name of the company then and it soon became a pretty familiar name through the outage shortwave magazine you know and the other radio journals so you pretty quickly outgrew that back room. Yes um, it there was only the two of us to start with, but we we couldn't really cope. Um, so we bought an old bakery in Beltinge um, and uh, tidied it up and got the offices going. And that was fine until we outgrew that. We ended up with about 23 people and we were falling over each other. So 23 people in that tiny bakery. Yeah. Was it just amateur radio still then or had you begun to branch out? Just started to branch out into marine radio first and the first radio was the M20 which was a white coloured one and uh, completely waterproof so it, uh, that worked out very well. What was the big turning point in amateur radio because I remember the first ring and I, I couldn't even afford one of these one of my friends had an IC22A and that, those mm -hmm. first ones they were crystal controlled weren't they and I don't yeah. think they came with 22 crystals in when you bought no, them. No they didn't they didn't they actually came with uh, about four and <laughs> I spent many, many evenings uh, putting in crystals and you have to line them all up. And it was hard work. And of course, we had probably only sold about 10 radios a day then, but I still had to do 10 radios. Uh, yeah, and people uh, would say, I want uh, the LO repeater was big then, yeah. wasn't it? So they want... We got all the crystals and uh, it had, um, yes, it was hard work, but it was 
just very enjoyable at the time. So when it moved on to synthesised rigs, I suppose that was a big jump forward. Yes, the first one was the 225, which uh, um, was synthesised, 25kc spacing, and uh, we had all the channels. It reduced the workload, there's no doubt about it. <laughs> so how long did it take before you then outgrew the, the refurbished bakery? Uh, I suppose about 10 years, and um, we ended up buying uh, a factory unit down in C Street in Herne Bay. And by this point, the marine had become very important to you yes. and, and business radio was beginning And we'd to also happen. started um, uh, PMR radio at the time. So uh, it was all, it was, uh, we, we had to work with the Home Office with type approvals and that was hard work too. One of the important things about ICOM UK is, is still to this day a family business. So who in the family is working in the business now? Yes, I have two sons, uh, Robert and Andrew, and uh, Rob, he prefers to be called Bob. He, he's the RMD now, and uh, Andrew's also a director, so we've got those two as directors, and they help run the business very well indeed. So what sort of age were they when they came into the business? Uh, well, they all started uh, in packing. Um, we all started from the bottom. I used to do packing, um, and that's where they started, and uh, they worked through the, the way through the different jobs. At least they were excused the crystalling up the IC22As. Yes, so they didn't have that. <laughs> they were able to miss out that bit. Yeah. Uh, it must be quite hard, I suppose, for you now to be standing back a little from the business and letting them get on with it. Yes, but um, things move on and uh, the youngsters come along and they've got a slightly different attitude. And uh, it's good. It's a family business and we're not actually working for someone, we're working for ourselves. And the business really has moved on, hasn't it? Because you then outgrew that factory premises to come five years ago to where we are now. Yes, um, a big move here, um, but it's, it is lovely. Most of it was designed by Bob, uh, my son, and uh, he did a very good job. Uh, to be honest, I would have been much more careful with our money. <laughs> so do you ever find yourself wanting to say to the guys, I mean, do you have any input into the business now or, or do you um, just let them get on with it? I let them get on with it. I have a little bit of input every now and then, but uh, I let them get on with it. But I'm, I'm a listening ear. If anybody wants to uh, talk to me, then they can do. So that's the first 40 years of ICOM UK. Uh, how do you see the next 40 years playing out? I can see that uh, we're going to move more and more towards digital techniques. Um, I don't really know. It's uh, difficult to see how the youngsters coming along getting a grasp of things because I started with valves and worked my way through. What you really need is people who, who have that kind of love th that comes with the radio amateur that you had when you were yeah. young, sort of pulling things to bits and putting them back together and I modding them. And yeah, I think radio, ra amateur, the amateur radio fraternity is a very good background for an awful lot of different electronic fields. It's a good grounding and generally they have their heart in it. Uh, so what's your favourite thing in amateur radio at the moment? Uh, well, I do, I, I, I spend a bit of time on 160 metres, but uh, 10 metres, there's uh, quite a lot of, quite a lot going on, 10 as it's open just at the moment, 40 metres, it's quite a bit, but that's about it. I, uh, I used to be mad on repeaters, but I'm not so much now. Yeah. Yeah. And over the years, has it been nice to be able to, as a radio amateur, review the kit that you've had from ICOM when there's something new coming onto the market that you're able to look at it with a radio amateur's eyes and yeah. see how this is going to play. Yeah, I do. I'm, there's one big thing I'm always complaining about. Um, as I'm getting older, my eyes are getting worse, the knobs are getting smaller and the buttons are small and I can't read the writing. That's my big complaint at the moment, but all the radios are the same. They're just getting that way. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for telling us about the history of ICOM UK so far, and here's to the next 40 years, Dave. Thank you very much. It's a very big place, this, and an awful lot of stock, as we can see all around us here. And that essentially is the name of the game for you guys, because you've got to be thinking ahead in all the different areas, you know, marine, amateur, business radio, aviation, the stuff that people are going to want. How, how do you predict what to get in stock? Probably the most difficult area to keep a handle on is land mobile because we have large uh, tender contracts that, that come along and quite often we'll have quoted for something and then six months later the customer will confirm the order but then of course they want delivery in a few weeks time. If we haven't got the stuff here then it takes us 12 weeks minimum to get it built but 
yeah, we've got a lot of stuff in here. And our motto has always been, if you haven't got it, you can't sell it. It's very interesting as to why you have a, an ICOM UK business. Because you could think, well, you could just import straight from Japan. People could get the stuff and, and just use it themselves. But the point is that you actually really tailor make your equipment or adjust it or modify it according to the requirements of the market here. So you have that very um, direct connection with your customers in the UK. That's right. We try and tailor make um, the package that the customer receives ultimately what they want. So whether that's a piece of amateur radio equipment, a mobile or a hand portable, marine radio, um, land mobile uh, or aviation, we carry out modifications or market preparation on most of the boxes we sell. And actually we're very different to a lot of other icon businesses in the way that we uh, put our product onto the market. So you do produce some of your own accessories to equipment, don't you? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we've just done a job recently for um, a search and rescue organisation where they wanted um, a black box add-on to one of our marine radios, but ultimately they wanted to use it with a, one of our compatriots' pieces of navigational equipment using a LCD touchscreen uh, flat screen monitor. So we developed all of that in-house. And does that mean it's fairly easy for the customer to talk to you guys here? We'd like to think so. Uh, we never hide behind our telephone number or anything. We don't have a receptionist as such. If the phone rings, we pick it up. Anybody, if it's ringing, you answer it. And we're all about customer service. Where do you think the future is going for your business? Because it's grown and grown and grown. Um, there are a lot of other technologies around now, internet technology. Uh, does RF radio communications still have a big future? Yeah, of course. I mean, look at us talking now. You're always going to need to talk. Um, whether you're a forklift driver in a warehouse, uh, whether you're two guys on a construction site, somebody in a crane. Um, Two-way radio, analog, is always got, going to have a future. Uh, of course, digital radio is a big thing for us. But we're using things like uh, internet, IP, radio, as a um, add-on to our business. So we can talk to uh, people across the net in a different country, if you like, or in a different part of the UK on a normal, low-power, hand-portable radio using, using, uh, using an IP connection. And is there a connection as well between amateur radio and your wider business in the sense that we need more young people interested in technical things so that we produce more apprentices for businesses like yours in the future? Exactly. I mean, all our clever guys in the, in the lab are all radio amateurs. What we need young people getting into the hobby, understanding how the equipment works, how it's put together, so we can repair it, so we can develop it, so we can tweak it and enhance it um, for, for, for future business.